The Lord be with you. And also with you. Good morning and welcome. <laughs> Wednesday is the last day for uh, pictures for the pictorial directory. We have a number signed up, but we need a few more, or else they're going to shut us out on that day. Rianne uh, Wagner is, is in the back, or she was in the back. Uh, maybe the easiest way to schedule it would be to call Rianne, and her number is in the, in the, in the, in the uh, bulletin. Women of Good Shepherd invite you all to the ice cream social this morning. It takes place right after the 8 a.m. service, uh, serve, uh, serving ice cream. They'd like to inform you also of their plans for this coming year and also give highlights from the National LWML Convention that was held in, in Milwaukee that takes place between services. Ron's Bible study will carry on as will my own adult confirmation class. Um, Matins today, page 219, opening hymn, Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven, 793. Joyful noise to him with songs of praise. 
Blessed be God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. O come, let us worship This time I, I welcome the children to please come up for a brief children's message. Come on up. Come on, Gestels. <laughs> Brandon, how about it? Excellent. You can have a seat right here on the floor or right here on the bench. Maybe that's a little bit better. You guys know what a locksmith is or what a locksmith does? They work on locks. They're, they're true craftsmen. They work on every kind of lock, whether it's keys to the door or keys to your car. I have an old set of keys here. I bought this from a locksmith in Madrid, country of Spain. I don't know how old they are. They must be hundreds of years old. Um, and you can imagine how big a gate these keys could open how thick they have to be for this thing to get right into the middle of it and, and unlock the gate. It kind of reminds me of those keys up there in that window, the keys that open the gates. In our gospel lesson, Jesus said, I give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. It's about forgiveness, who the church forgives and who the church should not forgive. Let's say there's a guy named, by the name of Frank. Frank is a member of the church here. He's not a real guy, he's a mythological character. I'm just making him up. And Frank comes in to me one day and says, Pastor, I'm gonna rob the bank next weekend. Would you forgive me for doing that before I do that? Would it be right for me to forgive him? I don't think so either. To forgive somebody for what he's about to do? 
when he has no sorrow over it or repentance? What if he were to come back a couple weeks later and say, Pastor, I robbed the bank and I was able to pay off my car and I feel really badly about it. I feel really badly about it. The, the guy, the, the, the bank teller was so sad and so scared. Um, I gotta rob one more bank <laughs> in order to pay off the house. Would it be right for me to, and he wants me to forgive him, would it be right for me to forgive him? No, because he's not sorry, is he? I can't forgive a guy for what he's about to do when he's not sorry about it, or unrepentant is the word. He, he, he's going to do it anyway. Let's say there's another person, um, a woman that is not a member of our, Cecilia. <laughs> Help me remember, Cecilia. Um, she and her husband get into a big fight and she raises her voice and she says some bad things to her husband, even calls her husband a bad name. And, then, and she just feels awful about it. The next morning she wakes up and she apologizes to her husband sincerely and he forgives her. Um, but she comes into my office and, and says, Pastor, I, I did apologize, and he did forgive me, but I still feel so badly about that. I never want that to happen again. I don't want to call uh, my husband a bad name. I don't want to get angry at him like that. I don't want to shout at him. Uh, I don't want that ever to happen again. Will you forgive me? Would it be right for me to forgive <coughs> Cecilia? I think so, too because she's repentant. She doesn't want it to happen again. And so that's when it's a pleasure for a pastor to say, as far as the east is from the west, so far are your sins removed from you. And it's the forgiveness of sins that opens the gates to eternal life. That's what we need the most, more than the air we breathe. We need forgiveness because that opens the gates of heaven. Jesus has given us those keys to forgive sins and sometimes not to forgive sins when there's no repentance. Thank you for coming up. We continue with the office hymn. <laughs>
The Old Testament reading for the 13th Sunday after Pentecost is from Isaiah chapter 56. Thus says the Lord, keep justice and do righteousness. For soon my salvation will come and my deliverance be revealed. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, everyone who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it and holds fast my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. The Lord God, who gathers the outcasts of Israel, declares, I will gather yet others to him besides those already gathered. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. That was the Old Testament lesson from last weekend. Forgive me, please. The Old Testament lesson from, for this weekend is from Isaiah chapter 51. Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness, you who seek the Lord, look to the rock from which you were hewn and to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah who bore you. For he was but one when I called him, that I might bless him and multiply him. For the Lord comforts Zion, he comforts all her waste places, and makes her wilderness like Eden, her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving and the voice of song. Give attention to me, my people, and give ear to me, my nation. For a law will go out from me, and I will set my justice for a light to the peoples. My righteousness draws near. My salvation has gone out, and my arms will judge the peoples. The coastlands hope for me, and for my arm they wait. Lift up your heads to the heavens, and look at the earth beneath. For the heavens vanish like smoke, the earth will wear out like a garment, and they who dwell in it will die in like manner. But my salvation will be forever, and my righteousness will never be dismayed. O oh Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. A reading from Romans chapter 11. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor, or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. 
O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 16th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly set in the heavens. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The sermon text is from the Gospel lesson. Whatever you bind on earth, Jesus said, will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Most of us use some kind of key every day. You use the car key to get here this morning. The elders used a key to open up the building. Children may use keys to secure their bikes. We usually don't think of keys too much until we've lost them or locked them in the trunk or in the office or for some reason they no longer work. Talked about these keys already. This key hung around my neck on a recent cruise in, in Greece. Got me on board the ship. They shot it with a little scanner and said, welcome aboard, Mr. Graf. <laughs> this key gave me entrance to the ship. It gave me entrance to uh, my room. It gave me entrance to the ship's buffet and to various excursions. When I held it up at dinner, it almost magically refilled my, my, my cup. I loved this key. But if I were to show up willy-nilly next week, wherever the ship is at port, and if I were to go to the front entrance and hold up my little friend here like I owned the place, do you think they would let me in? Would it work? Would they know my name? Would they at least refill my drink? Not a chance. Some keys work well, others not so much, because the trip has expired, or the car has been junked, the, 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 the deadlock has been rekeyed, the padlock is lost. In our text, Jesus talks about the most important keys of all, keys that will always work. He says, I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. These are remarkable words, really. And they speak of a, an extraordinary burden, heavy burden of responsibility that Jesus has placed on his church. Realize this statement is not just an anomaly, a, 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 anomaly, a, a one and done mysterious sort of thing. This 
he mentioned multiple times, in multiple ways, and in various places. When Jesus rose from the dead and appeared before his disciples in the upper room, he said to them, as the Father has sent me, so now I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold the forgiveness of any, it is withheld. Jesus is speaking here to Christian congregations through time, in every place and at every time. Jesus is promising when the called ministers of Christ absolve those who repent of their sins, this is just as valid and certain in heaven as on earth as if our Lord Jesus Christ was dealing with us himself. Real forgiveness, full for forgiveness, genuine, lasting forgiveness. Later in Matthew 18, Jesus tells his disciples how Christians should handle grievances. If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. Just between the two of you. If he listens to you well and good, if he doesn't listen, take along one or two witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses even to listen to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. That is, regard him as outside the Christian fellowship. And then Jesus says, truly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Amazing as it may seem, Jesus has entrusted the keys of the kingdom of heaven to his church. He's given his church authority to withhold forgiveness from those who are unrepentant, but also to give the gift of divine pardon to all repentant sinners. Jesus speaks of two keys here. The first is for binding, locking of doors. Scripture gives us a striking example of this, this first key. Apparently in the church of Corinth, well, Paul receives a, a report from Corinth that there's a guy there, a member of the congregation, who has been having an incestuous relationship with his father's wife. It doesn't say with his mother, so we're probably talking about his stepmother. Paul tells them this sort of immorality isn't even tolerated among the pagans who tolerated nearly everything else. It certainly shouldn't be tolerated within God's church, among those who claim to be Christian. And this fellow, already having been warned, apparently was flaunting his shameful behavior. You can imagine then the, the, what this was doing to the unity of the church, the reputation of the church, and to the reputation of Jesus himself. They were people of the way. These were people who were supposed to be followers of Jesus. They're called Christians. His name, he bears on them, they bear on them his name. But this isn't how Jesus lived, and it's not how his disciples should be living either. Paul tells the church, don't you know that a little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough? Don't you know that if you don't address, this, address it, others may think, well, this must be okay. And that anything goes in God's church. Let him who has done this be removed from you, Paul says. And then a few verses later, purge the evil person from among you. That is, excommunicate him. Deny him the sacrament. Tell him the forgiveness of Jesus is not for him. So long as he is living in unrepentant sin, no longer welcome at the Lord's table. The Book of Concord says, truly, Christian excommunication is this. Open and hard-hearted sinners are not admitted to the sacrament until they amend their lives and avoid sin. Only God can condemn the sinner eternally. But this is a practical decision to preserve the church from division, from confusion, from hypocrisy, and other corrosive influences. 
is to prevent the guy from eating and drinking judgment on himself, as Paul talks about, again, to the church in Corinth. And it's also hopefully meant to compel the unrepentant sinner to repent. The work of the binding key is to show people who refuse to repent the seriousness of their sin. And his goal is to rescue them from eternal condemnation, win them back for Christ. Now, remember Jesus makes it clear, we have enough logs in our own eyes. We don't need to go out looking for specks in the eyes of fellow believers. Nevertheless, some sin compels us to confront the sinner. If you're at the supermarket and someone falls unconscious before you, compassion compels you to do what you can to help that person. Similarly, believers must have compassion on those within their church who live in sin and seem oblivious to its consequences. The most unloving thing to do would be to turn a, a blind eye toward it all. Because the only sin that damns us is the sin that we hold on to, the sin that we're not going to repent of, the sin that we don't think we need forgiveness for. Forgiveness is for repentant sinners, not for those who don't want it or think they don't need it. Someone may object and say, well, only God can look into someone's heart and judge whether there's repentance and faith. That's true. That's very true. The church only deals with what people do and with what people say. We cannot read the hearts. We can only look at the actions of men and women, what they confess with their words, but also what they do or what they refuse to do. We deal with the works alone, not with the heart. Nevertheless, Jesus has directed, commanded us to deal with the facts as we know them. We have no choice but to obey Jesus. This binding key is it's not a happy key to use. And often because of hardness of heart, it doesn't work. People just walk away. But sometimes it works. Sometimes it brings erring brothers or sisters back to Christ in repentance and faith. This in turn brings joy to the church on earth, even joy in heaven. Jesus said, there's more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Jesus speaks of two keys. The second key is the key that loosens. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. It's, it's kind of odd language, right? Whenever I wrote loose in, in the sermon, it would have a little squiggly line on the computer screen, as if, do you really want to use this word? Yep, I want to use this word because it's the best translation of the Greek, which is luo, which is used for being released from prison in the Bible or from the putting off of fetters or shackles. It means to unbind, to loose. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Sin imprisons us. That's what it does, and it entangles us. It puts us in shackles. Jesus said everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Forgiveness, however, releases us from prison, frees us. It throws off the fetters and the shackles. It even releases us from the grip of death. In front of the tomb of Lazarus, Jesus cried out, Lazarus, come out. Immediately the dead man came out. He's all wrapped up in, in, in death clothes, uh, bands. He looks sort of like what we would think of uh, as a mummy. And Jesus says, unbind him. The same verb from Luo, loosen him. Take all that stuff off of him and let him go. That's what forgiveness does for us. It frees us and rescues us from sin and death 
and hell, from shame and guilt, and it gives us eternal life in Christ. It's a key that works only for repentant sinners. It says Christ's forgiveness is for you. As far as the east is from the west, so far has your transgression been removed from you. It's a key that invites, bring your family and friends. The door is for them too. This key is, it can open the gates of heaven for them too. And these gates can open for all people, not just the wealthy elite. It's free for all. It costs Jesus everything. It costs you nothing. Have you ever thought of how much it costs to use keys? How much did it, money did it cost you to, to chirp your key fob open, uh, to open your car and, and just go? Or how about the key to your house? How much did that cost you? This key was expensive too, but expired as soon as I stepped off the ship on the last day. And now it's, it's useless. But the key that opens to you the gates of heaven still works, still free. Jesus paid all the costs on the cross. You pay none. And the consequences are forever. It never expires. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. That, that first key, that's a heavy, sad responsibility that the Lord has placed on his church. An unhappy business. We're tempted to set it aside and just not make use of it, but we cannot ignore the Lord's command and expectations. The other key, what a delight. What a delight to proclaim forgiveness and the Lord's favor and grace to those who are really sorrowful about their sins. What a delight to hear he will remember our sins no more. Words of absolution alone, one of my professors said, words of absolution alone ought to be enough to entice us to keep coming back. Sooner or later, every key on earth will expire and be rendered useless. But the key that loosens and unbinds, that key opens the door. It unlocks the gates where we find room and welcome for us in the eternal kingdom of heaven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Peace of God, which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Please stand.
In our prayers, we pray for those that we've listed here. We pray for Ruth Shaneke also, who will be having surgery on Tuesday. We pray in uh, celebration of the 40th anniversary of John and Tanya Dimitropoulos. Congratulations to you both. And the 57th anniversary of Bob and Gretchen Martins. We pray for our college students as well, who have been leaving and are still leaving uh, for colleges and universities across the land. Please stand for prayer. Christ have mercy. Lord have mercy. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, hear my prayer. And let my cry come to you. Almighty God, whom to know is everlasting life, grant us to know your Son, Jesus, to be the way, the truth, and the life, that we may boldly confess him to be the Christ and steadfastly walk in the way that leads to eternal life. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, you desire not the death of a sinner, but that all would repent and live. Hear our prayers for those outside the church. Take away their iniquity and turn them from false gods to you, the living and true God. Gather them into your holy church to the glory of your name, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, through your Son, you have promised us forgiveness of sins and everlasting life. Govern our hearts by your Holy Spirit, that in our daily need, and especially in all time of temptation, we may seek your help. And by a true and li lively faith in your word, obtain all that you have promised through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O Father of mercies and God of all comfort, our only help in time of need, look with favor upon your servants who are ill, who are facing surgery, who are recovering from surgery, for those who are facing death. Assure them of your mercy. Deliver them from the temptations of the evil one. Give them patience and comfort in their illnesses. If it please you, restore them to health or give them grace to accept their tribulations with courage and hope. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. O Lord, merciful Father, sustain and comfort your servants who are mentally ill. Do not allow the evil one to pester them, but provide them with people who in wisdom and sympathy will minister to them in their need. Strengthen them and their families in the knowledge of your redeeming love so that they may evermore look to you for rescue and help. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We pray, Lord, for those who are returning to college. Bless them, Lord. Keep them. Preserve them from all harm and danger, from sin and temptation, from every evil. Assure them of your presence. Help them to find a place to worship you in truth with others. And bring them safely home for breaks. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O oh Lord Jesus, your mercies are new every morning. We thank you for another year of married life together for John and Tanya, for Bob and Gretchen. Open their hearts always to receive more of your love, that their love for each other may never grow weary, 
but deepen and grow through every joy and sorrow shared. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have safely brought us to the beginning of this day. Defend us in the same with your mighty power and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but, all, but that all our doings being ordered by your governance may be righteous in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Please be seated. Stephanie Malby, on behalf of the Gulf Outing. Come on up, Stephanie. Um, uh, as you know, part of our <laughs> part of our um, playground down here was removed because it was becoming unsafe. Come on, right up here, and uh, uh, that's what the PTL is working so feverishly on uh, uh, to replace that as one of their goals uh, for the golf outing. So, just a reminder to everybody that we have our 22nd annual golf outing coming up on September 7th. So we are begging and pleading and praying that uh, you all kind of step up. You have in the past helped support the school tremendously. Uh, all the, the little odds and ends that we do, um, this is a big project that we are heading this year. So registration does end soon. Um, you all received a letter in the mail with the traditional registration sheet, but we also have a website that's available. Um, so there's a link in today's bulletin. Um, we've got a QR codes hiding all over the place or are spread out throughout all of the place. So um, we'd love to invite you all there. Um, it's a great event. We've got golfing in the afternoon and we also have a couple auctions going on. Um, the auction table is already out with the donations. So we hope to see you all there. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. This closing hymn, we sang it for the very first time two weeks ago. Beautiful little hymn. I wanted to sing it again so that we learn it better. Um, Phil and Maggie will sing the first verse. We join in the others. <laughs> 